Hey everybody, it's Scott from scottythenjmedium.com. Welcome back. We are on podcast number five. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm not losing any interest. Hopefully you're not. The numbers look A-OK for what I'm doing, so we're going to keep pressing on. Last week, we talked a little bit about the current Ghost Hunters uh, episodes, and then we talked about some other really cool things. And then I got really busy, so I didn't record a podcast, but here we are. It's uh, Friday currently today, Friday the 13th. If you're listening this after Friday the 13th, which you very may well be, did you have any interesting things happen to you? It's the middle of the day right now and I haven't had any bad luck happen. Uh, knock on wood. Do you have any strange superstitions that you stick to? Uh, do you knock on wood when you say something like nothing's bad, bad has happened yet? And then you'd like knock on wood like I just said, you ready? Yeah, I got to keep doing it every time I say it because I don't want anything bad to happen. Uh, it's a really interesting thing, the Friday the 13th uh, superstition that bad things will happen to you on a day like today. I'm not really sure where it came from because Fridays are generally a good day. If you work Monday through Friday, Fridays are like, well, it's the end of the week. It's time to get done with this stuff and be be done with the week and then go have your, you know, your Friday afternoon um, happy hour drink, and you know if you're in a sport, you go watch games over the weekend. Uh, family person, hang out with your family, and if you're a paranormal investigator, Friday is uh, the perfect time to start getting geared up for your weekend investigations. Uh, and then thirteen, somehow thirteen got a really negative connotation somewhere. I'm not really sure where that happened or when, but I I know obviously that it is bad. But uh, generally, uh, as far as numerology goes, thirteen is a pretty solid number. And, you know, that superstition of it being negative really followed into things. I'm sure you know this. If you've been on any building that goes above the 13th floor, that sometimes they skip that. Uh, they'll do 1 through 10, 11, 12, 14, 15. And then you say, wait a minute. Don't try to trick me. I know that 14 is really 13. You just didn't give it the right label. So joke's on you. I know this is the 13th floor. If you want to think of it that way. Otherwise, it's a really interesting thing that they do there by putting that, uh, by labeling the 13th floor 14 and, and skipping over 13, but whatever. So here we are, Friday the 13th. I hope that nobody in a hockey mask is chasing you down unless it's your thing and it's your Friday afternoon activity and you're out there hitting the ice. Uh, in any case, uh, let's just talk a little bit about uh, the Ghost Hunters episodes in the last two weeks. Uh, if you don't want any spoiler alerts and you haven't seen them yet, uh, both episodes last week and this week were fairly good. Uh, I enjoyed them. One of the things that I enjoyed about last week was they went into a home that a woman was selling and, uh, she was allegedly selling it because it was so haunted that she couldn't stand to stay there anymore. Well, that's interesting, right? Because... You invest your life oftentimes and your life savings into a home or a house. And then to be run out by alleged paranormal activity is really interesting. Like, what would it take for you personally to get run out of your home from, you know, paranormal activity, a ghost, uh, or a general, let's just use, use the word haunting. So, like, we, we don't know what the activity is, but what would it take for you to get kicked out of your house by a ghost or some haunting activity. Uh, I've lived in quite a few places that I would allege were haunted, uh, that had some paranormal activity. Uh, my children, uh, my eldest daughter in one place that we lived claimed that she would get held down at night. Uh, she would hear my guitar play itself when I was nowhere near it. And one time I even witnessed a piece of fruit jump off of a countertop. And for anybody who's listening that might be skeptic, I could tell you it didn't roll off. It didn't like get hit by anything else and fall. It was thrown up into the air. So a forward arch like a basketball and then across the room about like two feet. Uh, and it was really something to behold. Like you can't really imagine it unless you see it happen. Uh, and that didn't kick us out. However, the negativity in the home got so bad that we didn't want to stay there anymore. So the negative feelings that everybody in the house was experiencing between each other was enough. And that broke it up. So we left from there. And that was enough. Sometimes there are things that are so negative that you just can't live with them. And if you don't have the help, 
you have to go. And at the time, I didn't know what to do about things like that. So, you know, what would get you out of a house? So this lady said that she was experiencing, uh, on Ghost Hunter, she was experiencing black shadow figures, uh, somebody pushing her down the steps, and a creepy feeling in the basement. And Grant and the team did a really great job. They uh, used all of their uh, equipment to check for EMF, gas leaks, I think they checked for CO emissions, all kinds of environmental things that we would look for uh, going into a home like that. And they couldn't find anything. Then they checked the entire home and there was nothing going on for several hours as so the episode went. Then uh, they brought the woman into the environment, the woman who had all of the claims, the homeowner, and things started to spike. Uh, and then they decided that there is a likely possibility that she was the reason for the activity. Uh, perhaps that she was creating a PKE manifestation or that she was creating a poltergeist scenario inside the home, which I thought was a really cool uh, conclusion. Uh, however, just being how I am, I would just say like this. How would you get to that? So if we took her and put her anywhere, then, then we should have some sort of PKE manifestation. There should be something happening everywhere that she goes in order to uh, come to that conclusion that she was the person with the energy creating the poltergeist around her. Okay, so anywhere she went, she would have have activity, right? So I, uh, I did post on one of the pages and I just asked and I don't ever do this to be negative or take shots at anybody because that's not the, the reason I do any of this. But I did pose the question like, um, did we consider what I just said there? Uh, and also, what are the chances that there was a entity or a spirit uh, or just an energy there that she didn't get along with or it didn't get along with her and it didn't like her? Um, so to speak, we'll say like for a lack of better vocabulary words. Um, and, you know, her energy coming in acted as like a magnet. If you took the positive and negative or a positive and positive, I, I forget how it works, but you know, you take the two magnets and you try to press them together and they, they push away from each other, creating energy like that. So who's to say that there wasn't anything in that house that was repelling against her. And that's why we got the energy spikes. And once she's taken out of the environment, the energy uh, stops getting pushed into each other and butted against each other. So that stops. So that was like my my thing. So we always want to test everything. And I know they're making a TV show. So, you know, I, I would give them the leeway. I wish I could have been there to just suggest that um, and test her maybe in the hotel room or wherever it was that she was living and see if they could get any other kind of activity around her aside from at the house just to test that theory. Uh, other than that, it was a really good episode. And that was last week's uh, episode three, then episode four just aired. And that was really cool. They're at this place in Ohio with some sort of mansion or, uh, it started off or like a castle or something. I, I forget what exactly the terminology they use, but it was in Ohio. And, uh, the owner's father started building this place from a barn. And then it turned into this like magnificent structure with like towers and, uh, turrets and all kinds of like interesting things. And they uh, were having a lot of activity in the place. And one of the uh, main themes of the episode was fire. So they had uh, a kitchen burned down on location. And then as the team was investigating a fireplace in one of the rooms was turned on after, I guess, people had checked all the rooms to make sure there's nobody in there and that there's... Uh, you know, everything's baseline. So I would imagine that a producer or somebody on the crew would have gone through and been like, okay, you know, there's no, no reason. There's no fireplaces on the beds are made. Everything looks as it should. And then two of the cast members or, uh, cast members or, um, investigator, sorry about that, went into one of the rooms and the fireplace was on. It was a gas fireplace. And they said the room was extremely hot. So now you have another fire theme coming in uh, to add to the claim of that. And then Grant and uh, maybe somebody else were in the kitchen and they were smelling natural gas. And then they checked and the pilot lights were out on the stove. And that's really interesting because what what is the purpose of, a, of the paranormal activity or if there's an entity there, what is the purpose of that energy? Why would it 
try to burn the place down? Do they want them out? What is there some sort of repeat history happening? What happened prior to the original structure of the barn being there? Was there any fires in the area that happened that is kind of leading to the causes now? And is it safe for people to be in there now? Uh, I kind of missed the end of the episode, to be quite honest with you. I was getting really tired. It had been a long day. But I think that they had deemed that it was safe for them to stay there. Oh, and they also had, uh, which I thought was a really great idea, they had some uh, fire alarm installers and experts come in and check all the alarms in, in the building because the fire alarms had been going off quite often. And the guys who came in to check it said that there was no reason that they could find for the um, alarms to just keep tripping and going off. So it was really interesting that that just kept happening. And then they had experts try to debunk why it was happening and they couldn't find it. So what led to that, right? That's just something that I would personally think that um, I don't know how long they were there, but that's one of those cases where you want to stay on that as an investigator and really just keep testing it, uh, test it through the seasons, test it through the, the weeks and the days, people coming and going, uh, staff members, like you really have to get into that because obviously fire is an extremely destructive thing. And there could be more than just a human entity at play there. And I don't mean, let's not use the D word there. Let's just go with possibly an elemental spirit that was there prior to any structures being there. And elementals are very tied to the earth and they don't like human beings in their business. As a matter of fact, they can cause a lot of trouble. So that's something that um, they should really look into. If you don't know what an elemental is, we will get into that. And I'll make a note here on my little paper to talk about that another time. But basically, let's just say like elementals are beings or entities that have been there since like the earth formed. And they're, and they're really grounded in their spot. So there's something interesting to talk about. So let's go. Uh, Psychic Kids was on after that. I haven't watched it yet. I'm going to watch it later on tonight and I'll talk about it next week. I figure I could watch these and talk about them a couple of little clip and it kind of helps, you know, break it down a little bit. Let's talk because uh, I like TV and I always tell people when I do readings like, boy, I watch way too much TV. I just love it. I love entertainment and t television obviously is uh, a huge part of how we get our entertainment and of course on YouTube and all those kinds of things. So one of the posts that keeps coming up on my other page, Scotty the NJ Medium's Paranormal Discussion page, is this new television show. It's not coming out on TV. It's coming out, it is coming out on television, but it is coming out through like a streaming service and I don't remember what it was, but I, I'll tell you the name of the show is called Murder House Flip. Okay, let that sink, sink in for a second. Murder House Flip. So this isn't like Chip and Joanne Gaines are going into a, an old structure that's kind of beat up and they're going to turn it into your beautiful dream home. It's more like Ed Gaines lived there and now Joe Schmo and his buddy Rocky are going to go in there and cover the blood-soaked walls up with paint and sell you the house. Uh, the premise of the show is that they're going into homes that were involved in horrific events, murders, and other types of tragedies where people lost life, and they are going to fix them up and sell them to, you know, you or me. I don't know if they have to disclose that that's what it is. I assume that if, and I hate to assume things, but I assume that if you're going to go on a television show that somebody has to tell you like, uh, yeah, you're going on the show because they, they have these houses that are going to be turned. Or maybe you already know that it's a, a house that bad things happened in or a location that bad things happened in and you're going to give it to these guys to, to flip it and turn it into something nice. Would you live in a house like that? Uh, recently I had read that, um, Zach Bagans had purchased the Sharon Tate estate. Uh, I know that the ho original house was knocked down, but there is another house in its place. Maybe it would be okay to live there, but we know that spirits aren't always tied to the, to the, uh, structure, but sometimes the location, right? So let's just imagine that the house was still there. And you knew what happened to Sharon Tate's very famous murder, right? With uh, Charlie Manson and she was pregnant and she was murdered with uh, several other people. Would you be able to live in that house knowing something like that happened? Or we could take somebody, you know, a less 
famous murder. We could just make any scenario up where somebody was uh, horrifically murdered and their life was ended shortly. Would you purchase a house that you knew something really negative things happened in? Uh, there was a movie called, uh, ch ch let me think here. What was that movie with the guy and the family? It was in New York, right? And it like went, everybody like went, was like, oh, things are happening. And then the guy like went nuts and tried to kill everybody. Ed and Lorraine Warren investigated it. If you could think of what that movie was called. Or what famous case that was based on. You, you leave it down in the comments and let me know. It's, it's just completely slipping my mind right now. <laughs> um, I'm joking. It's the Amityville house, right? Would you be able to live a place like that? I don't think I could. Um, I don't think that a lot of people could live in a place like that. So this is a new show that's coming out. Murder House Flip. I will probably do my best to at least get my hand on hands on an episode or two to check it out and see what it's about and then report back to you when it is finally aired. All right. So let's take a quick little break here. My name is Scott from scottythenjmedium.com. Thanks for joining me here. We're talking all kinds of cool stuff and I have a couple new, a couple new things to talk about here in the next segment. Um, don't forget, October 5th, I'm going to be at the Shanley Hotel with Mike and Brian from the Demon Files. Uh, they're better known as the Flannel Brothers. Uh, they're extremely talented and experienced paranormal investigators. And I'm going to talk about a little segment that we did on Facebook Live coming up here in a couple minutes. If you didn't check it out, it's still going to be available. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to make it available on YouTube as well. So uh, if you have the chance, check it out. It was really interesting uh, what happened during that session. And uh, we're going to be up at the Shanley October 5th, 2019 we're going to do a, I'm going to do a gallery reading. I'm going to raffle off a one hour phone reading. And then we're going, the Shanley has some gifts. They're going to raffle off. Then we're going to go on a full on paranormal investigation through the night. I'm going to vlog it. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully we get some really cool experiences like I had gotten the first time. If you didn't have a chance to check that out yet, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's under the playlist Scotty Vlogs. Or you can simply type in the very haunted Shanley Hotel and look for my face standing outside of that hotel. It was a really good time. I caught a lot of really cool evidence there. Disembodied voices, spirit mists, EVPs, uh, equipment going crazy. It was really awesome. I had a really great time. And uh, the first time I went with the PARS team, if you need an investigation done, call PAR, or I'm sorry, uh, go <laughs> call. I'm like, you know, getting old here. Uh, go on parsinvestigations.com. You can check them out there or uh, Paranormal Activity NJ on Facebook and check them out there. All right, back to the show. Let's talk about this question. Now, I'm not putting this out. If you were listening to this and you're a part of uh, the group, I'm not saying your name or anything like that. These are all my own opinions, and uh, that's it. And I'm not trying to start, start any controversy here. I just have a question. For everybody listening, I assume that you have some interest in the paranormal or maybe you are a uh, experienced paranormal investigator. So my question is, should children go ghost hunting, go on paranormal investigations, quote unquote, for fun? So recently somebody posted up onto my uh, Scotty the NJ Medium's paranormal discussion page on Facebook, an event where children are invited, I assume with adults, uh, to a location that is known to have some paranormal activity and they, it's geared towards children. So my question is, is there like a good age that is okay to bring children like ghost hunting? Now, I know that a lot of us have probably been on ghost walks, which are interesting, but there's nothing to say that there's any interaction between the spirits and your children. Uh, but this is one of those times where they're like, okay, we're going to go into the location. It's a structure. Uh, here are your gizmos and gadgets and go ghost hunt. So is that dangerous? In my opinion, I think it's dangerous on a couple levels and I'll tell you why. So basically I've been called to so many different locations with uh, paranormal investigation teams or even just alone to go to speak to families that are having a lot of problems with paranormal activity. And a lot of times it stems from the children and it's a lot of the younger ones. 
they will experience things in their home that they can't quite understand. And it is quite terrifying. And as a, as my, myself, when I was younger, I experienced a lot of things that I couldn't explain and it was really scary. So having to go to these places, uh, and talk to children a lot and try to talk to them and explain to them what's happening, I feel is like one thing, like they're in crisis, they're in their home, mom and dad are financially tied to it and they can't leave. So our next step is to go in there and try to, I'm going to say eliminate, that's not quite the right term. Uh, we'll try to go in there and quell the situation. We'll try to remove the spirit or do our best to make it livable for the living and the spirit that's there, right? So that hopefully will make it not as frightening for the child. Uh, and then, you know, on the flip side of the coin, we have places that are geared up towards asking children to come and investigate. Now, we can't guarantee if there's any kind of activity in this place. Uh, however, I do know that um, people do go there to investigate the paranormal. And uh, that would lend to the idea that possibly there is activity happening there. I've not been there myself. Uh, someday I probably will go and check it out though. Um, so what are the chances that you send your kid there and they have some kind of experience and then they are from that point on terrified of the dark or everything becomes something that they think is paranormal or ghosts? I feel like it could be a bit of a slippery slope. It's one that I wouldn't bring my own children to get involved in. However, later on in life, when they're old enough, maybe like 15 or 16, I could start introducing them into those sorts of environmental uh, areas, into that kind of experience, and see if they're going to be interested in following and doing what I'm doing. And if they're not, hey, yeah, that's all right. They don't have to be. Um, or, you know, can we use it as a tool to bring children ghost hunting? So if, uh, kids are having trouble at home and they are afraid of things, is it a good way to bring them into an environment where we know there's activity, where we can monitor them as adults and do it like that? Uh, that's my, like, that's kind of my question. So what do you think? What's a, a good age to bring a child ghost hunting? What is too young? And what are the positives and negatives of doing it? And that's pretty much it uh, on that topic. So that's that's something cool I, th I think we could talk about. Um, leave a comment down below what you think. All right, let's get to the last part of today's show. Let's talk about what happened last week when I sat down with Brian and Mike and a couple haunted objects. Now, we... Uh, talked about haunted objects a show or two ago with my buddy JT. Uh, he has had no paranormal experience really. And if you listen to the podcast, I hope you did. You can check it out. Um, what, what happened when we sat down with the haunted clown and the haunted doll? It was really interesting. So most of the gadgets that would give us uh, some sort of visual or audio verification really didn't do anything. So the REM pods didn't do anything. The mail meter didn't do anything. Uh, the only thing that we had going was the K2 meter. And that really could have been due to the phone broadcasting a live event. I really thought about it later. And I think that that's probably what it was. However, it was spiking several times kind of on command. But it, again, it, it could just be a coincidence. And I really hate to make anything paranormal that could possibly be explained. So we got through and I'm going to, this is what I'm going to post up on to uh, Facebook. I'm going to make some clips of it and put it up for you to check out. Uh, and also on YouTube, we broke out this piece of equipment that Brian got as a gift called the Poltercom. And it's a spirit radio device. I uh, kept calling it ITC. So, uh, like inner transmental, some, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> ITC. So some sort of spirit communication box, uh, similar to a spirit box or a ghost radio or uh, an, uh, I guess it's not obvious because it's not preloaded with information. However, what it does is it scans through a bunch of channels. It has re like radio stations, right? And it creates white noise for things to uh, generate their own voices through. Now, if you watched it, 
this is kind of a rehash. If you didn't, I'm going to tell you what happened. And then you can go check it out. So we broke out the Poltercom and immediately the tension in the room gets heavier and it's almost like we opened up enough to whatever was possibly attached to either one of these objects that we have that, you know, the energy starts raising up and I start getting chills, goosebumps, the whole nine yards. And as that starts happening, we start to hear some really interesting voices come through the Poltercom. And what's really interesting is that one of the objects that I have is a doll and it's from Jamaica, according to the, the writing on the dolls from Jamaica. And the voices coming out of the radio have a very heavy Jamaican or island accent. I got to tell you, that really freaked me out. And if you watch the video, you can see my reaction. Like I was really taken aback by the fact that I could hear a Jamaican accent coming out of the radio. Now we had used this on one prior occasion together and we didn't hear anything like that. And Brian has used it several times and he verified he's never heard an accent come out of the radio. Everything that we had, we're on the Jersey shore. Uh, there's no radio stations that we are aware of that would have that kind of um, tone to it. So we don't have any like reggae stations. We don't have any island music stations that are coming through the AM or FM channels that we're aware of. And I did do a sweep in my car, digitally tuned radio in my Jeep, and I went station by station. I found, of course, you know, country music, hip hop stations, oldies, talk radio, but nothing that would have matched uh, what we were hearing. So that to me is really interesting. So being a medium and a psychic, I have to really tune in and get myself ready to make communication with the other side. I have to prepare myself through meditation, sometimes a little bit of fasting, and I really have to focus. Now we pull this Poltercom out, this ghost radio spirit box, we turn it on and it immediately starts spitting out all kinds of crazy stuff. It says some pretty pertinent things, things that are relative to what we're doing, the information we're picking up. And it was that easy. So are we at an age in technology where we're getting ready to really break through and prove that there is more on the other side? How much further can the developers of this kind of technology bring things where we're just going to be able to turn on the radio and then what's after that, the computer or the television, right? And just talk to grandma or talk to see our dog that passed away and all of that kind of stuff. Like how close are we to that? Have you ever had any experience with a spirit box or a spirit radio or a poltercom? If you have, leave a comment down below. Let me know what it was because I'm really interested uh, to know what happened. And I think that it would, if you're interested in this kind of thing, definitely check out the video on Facebook. You can fast forward it. Um, it's probably about an hour and a half into it. Uh, maybe a little bit less than that, and you can check out our session. But or you know, feel free to check out the whole session. It was a lot of fun, and Mike and Brian answered a lot of really cool questions about being on TV, uh, and about uh, their experiences doing the Demon Files. Uh, they worked with some really big names in the paranormal field, especially people who deal with the darker things, and will say uh, the D word, demon. Um, these guys are really the top of what they do. So it's really interesting to hear them, especially if you're an investigator or you just have questions about maybe some of the darker things. And if you think that anything is happening uh, around you that might be more than just paranormal, please feel free to reach out to myself. And if I think it warrants it, I will send it right on to Mike and Brian. In any case, mostly anything that I get, I will talk to uh, them or my my other team, that I, my original team that I, I'm a part of still, and that's the PARS team. And both types of teams have very specific functions as to what they do. So it's really cool to have both have a connection to both of them. So if you have any questions or if you need anything answered, if you have uh, any paranormal activity happening in your house, please reach out and let us know. We'd love to hear it. You can send me a message on Facebook. You can shoot me an email, scottynjmedium at gmail.com. Um, my Facebook like I said, or you can go over to, uh, what is that? ScottyTheNJMedium.com. I haven't said it a million times today, so I kind of almost forgot my own website. And that's what you get for staying up all night and watching ghost shows. You get tired the next day. In any case, uh, it's been a lot of fun talking to you today. I 
It's September, Friday the 13th. Watch out for killers with hockey masks. Don't try to outrun them. I think if you go in a lake and swim away, you'll be fine. That's just my personal opinion. If you can't swim, don't do that. If you can swim, I think it's a viable option. I don't know. I never really had the guts to watch those movies all the way through. So I might be full of baloney. Um, let's, uh, let's do that. All right. So stand by. Make sure that if you're listening to this on YouTube, click the like button, rock that subscribe button, ring the old bell, the paranormal bell, and then, uh, yeah, join us on all the, all the things you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Foursquare, uh, MySpace, uh, and uh, other such platforms. All right, guys, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. I'm Scott from scottythenjmedium.com. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Leave me a comment down below on things that you might like to talk about next time. See ya.